So it's now my great pleasure to welcome Alicia Foster, who is an art historian, curator, and a novelist. She wrote the first full account of women artists in Tate Collections in 2004. She curated the first museum show of Jessica Dismore's work in 2019, and her novel, Wallpage, was published in 2013. She is the curator and author behind the current exhibition at Pallet House Gallery on Greg John, which will travel to the Hoover Museum in Bath in October. Her book, which has the same title as today's lecture, has also been published. She is also a fellow of the Royal Literary Fund, and her doctoral research was on Gwen John. So we couldn't have a more perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I thought I'd begin by telling you the story of how my work on Gwen John started. I saw her paintings for the first time when I was 18, and I fell in love with them. And I also fell in love with the romantic, tragic story that was being told of this shy, unworldly, reclusive woman who hid away in her attic, painting alone and unknown only years after her death to be recognized as a genius. And then one day, a few years later, I visited the museum devoted to the sculptor Auguste Rodin in Paris, which some of you may know. I'd asked if I could go up to the archive to read Gwen John's letters to him, which are kept there. I knew that Gwen John had been Rodin's lover and had written to him often during their 10 year long affair. And what happened that day was a moment that I have never forgotten. Rather like at Kenwood, I climbed up the marble grand stairs and then went behind a door to where the servants used to go, up a flight of much narrower stairs to the attic of the Musée Rodin, which was where the archive was housed then. They put a box of letters in front of me, labelled in French, boring letters, <laughs> not interesting. That's what the label said. I think maybe they hoped they'd put me off. I opened the box and there was a huge pile of letters in Gwen John's clumsy schoolgirl French. She lived in France most of her adult life and her French never improved. And they, these were all the letters that she had written and sent to Rodin during the course of their affair. I began to read them. And what I found there shocked me. The woman who emerged was not a recluse at all. She wrote about life in the Parisian art world, about the artists she knew, many of them women I'd never heard of and some rather more famous men. She wrote about shopping at the Bon Marché department store to make the outfits that she designed to wear on the streets and in the studios of Paris. She wrote about walking in the parks along the Seine to the villages around the French capital. And she wrote sometimes explicitly about her affair with her lover, with Rodin. Once I'd seen these letters, my work had to take a different path. And the more I uncovered, the more the picture altered. The story I had to tell became one of connection rather than isolation, of a life of fierce independence that was hard won and uncompromising rather than a timid withdrawal from the world of the need for solitude to work and to make life on her own terms, but not of loneliness and certainly never ever of fear. Of an artist who won no small measure of success and recognition in her lifetime, but never by compromising a gift. This was a woman who met many of the great names of her time, Picasso and Matisse, neither of whom she thought much of, the poets Ezra Pound and Rainer Maria Rilke. Rilke became incredibly important to her, his work um, and his kind of philosophy of work and life. So as I said, my picture of her had changed, had to change. And though I felt unhappy at first about letting go of the myth, I mean, it's very beguiling. It's seductive and it's powerful. The portrait that emerged from my research, I think was more complex more fascinating to my mind anyway, and surprising, and I would argue more true. 
So to begin at the beginning, Gwen John left Wales, she'd been born in Haverford West and then brought up in the coastal town of Tenby. She left Wales to study at Slade in 1895, the year after her younger brother Augustus had been allowed to enrol there. That autumn, the autumn of her enrolment, she moved into an address on Euston Square, right by the busy station. Some of you might remember the old Euston Arch. She lived right next to the arch. You could see the people coming and going from the station from her room. The area was mixed up, noisy, constantly on the move. It was a long, long way from Tenby. For the next eight years, she spent much of her time moving between cheap rooms in the center of London. She even squatted for a time in a derelict building on Gower Street opposite the Slade. At the Slade, very unusually, male and female students were allowed to mix. Apart from in the life room, they were taught together. And outside the university, living away from home, this was an existence totally free of the convention and the domestic duties that an unmarried daughter would have been expected to fulfill at that time. It was difficult for Gwen John, certainly because she didn't have the money to live comfortably. Unlike many at the Slade, her family were not well off. There was no private income to support her, but she never looked back. She never returned to live in Wales. And here I think, uh, and this watercolor is in the show and the book, um, here she celebrates her new way of life. And this is a watercolor of a group of friends and her brother. That's her brother there with a hat, practicing his bohemian pose with his hat and beard and pipe. That's her sister Winifred who also came to London, but to study music. And interestingly, Gwen John puts herself outside the window. That's Gwen John there walking outside. She's not part of the interior. Um, it's believed that the figure next to her is her lover at the time, her boyfriend at the time, Ambrose McAvoy, the painter who she met at the Slade. At the Slade, Gwen John won prizes. Her work did not go unnoticed. An early self-portrait was hailed as a masterpiece by Augustus, and it was bought immediately by the Slade professor, Fred Brown. Her work was noticed really early on. Although her brother became much more famous in England and much more quickly, very quickly, he was described as a new Michelangelo. He had his first solo exhibition in 1899, and perhaps partly to make a name for herself from under his shadow, to move away from the shadow of his fame, Gwen John escaped soon after she had graduated from the Slade. In the autumn of 1898, she escaped to Paris. In the winter of 1898-9, so she travels to Paris with two Slade women friends, Gwen Salmond, who later married the painter Matthew Smith and gave up painting herself, and Ida Nettleship, who married Gwen John's own brother, Augustus, and also gave up painting. At this stage, the three women were all young, free and single. They took rooms in Montparnasse and they looked for art ateliers to train in. The two Gwens, Salmon and John, enrolled at the Academy Carmen, which was newly opened by the American painter, James McNeil Whistler. And here we have Carmen Rossi, manager of the Academy, and this may well have been painted by Whistler during Gwen John's time at the Academy. It was painted as a demonstration piece for the students. Who knows, it might've even been painted in front of Gwen John. Carmen, Carmen Rossi, whose portrait this is, was one of Whistler's favorite models. She was a sharp operator. She tried to charge the women more than the men. <laughs> and she stole work from Whistler's studio to sell on to dealers behind his back. But apparently he was so fond of her that he, he didn't prosecute. The Academy, not surprisingly, didn't last for long, but its influence on Gwen John was profound. Although she left Paris in 1899 to return to London for a while, it was at Whistler's that she developed the painting technique based on a meticulous planning of tonal variations that she would build on for the rest of her life. Her friend Gwen Salmon said simply that Whistler's was worth living for. And this early painting by Gwen John of her friend, Dorelia McNeil, 
of 1903 to 4 reveals something of what she learned during that first trip to Paris. Dorelia's real name was Dorothy, and she was a typist from South London who took evening art lessons and lived near Gwen John and Augustus John in Fitzrovia. Both of the Johns, apparently they might have bumped into her at a party, but they both immediately became fascinated by her. And in Augustus's case, this became a deep infatuation that harmed his marriage to Ida. In the summer of 1903, Gwen and Dorelia left London for a time for a walking tour of France, paying their way by drawing people they met along the way and sleeping outside. It's quite a thing for women in 1903 to four to do. They had intended to walk to Rome. <laughs> Not surprisingly, they only got as far as Toulouse. <laughs> Very ambitious. And they spent the winter there. And Gwen John painted a series of stunning portraits of her companion. And this one is from the Tate collection. And again, it's in the exhibition at Pallant. Dorelia, many years later, reminisced about her friend Gwen. She was rather amused at Gwen's reputation as an unworldly, selfless, rather saintly figure. Dorelia remembered things differently. Gwen John was not unconcerned with her appearance, Dorelia said, but in fact, always elegant and rather vain. Gwen John really enjoyed the good food and wine in France. And Gwen was apparently rather imperious. She had made Dorelia carry the heavy bags always as they walked across France, telling Dorelia that because she was an artist, she mustn't strain her hands. <laughs> Critics writing about the exhibition that's now on Upalant have picked up on the contrast between Gwen John and her brother's portraits of Dorelia, which are on show side by side there. And this is Augustus's portrait of Dorelia, who became his lifelong partner. And this is believed to be the earliest oil that he made of Dorelia. And it's in a private collection. We're very lucky to have it in the show. So Augustus's painting and Gwen's are painted in the same year. And I think they make a fascinating comparison because Gwen in her portrait, as she was always to do throughout her career, creates an impression of self-possession, a kind of inner life and intellect in her sitter. Well, I think Augustus is so polaxed by Dorelia's beauty that he paints her as a kind of sensual, luscious reverie. Dorelia and Gwen spent the winter of 1903-4 in Toulouse and then came back to Paris. Early in 1904, they arrived in Paris and they took a room in the same left bank area where Gwen John had lived several years before with her Slade friends. It's this area here. You've got the Jardin du Luxembourg here, the Eiffel Tower. It's kind of the Montparnasse, uh, Montparnasse area around there. They got a cat, the first of many that Gwen John would live with. And note, I don't say own, you don't own cats, do you? Dorelia then ran away with another artist. She tried to escape from the Johns and both Augustus and Gwen relentlessly pursued her. Augustus following her, trying to follow her across Europe and, and Gwen John pursuing her with letters. Her letters are actually fascinating because they are frankly, ruthless and rather manipulative. She writes to Dorelia at one point, you must leave your boyfriend. I know he's going to suffer, but it'll be good for him because that's how we learn through suffering. <laughs> so <laughs> absolutely ruthless in fulfilling what she thought she wanted. When Dorelia returned to Augustus and to England in 1904, Gwen John stayed in Paris for good and she was to stay there for the rest of her life. Augustus tried to persuade his sister to return, but she always said, no thanks, I don't want to go back. I want to flourish, she told him. And she knew that that hadn't happened for her in London. For the first decade in Paris, she lived in a series of rented rooms, all in that area of the left bank that I showed you, a place known as the artistic heartland of the city by that time. In the earlier period, um, the 1880s and 1890s, Montmartre had been the kind of heartland. By, by the time Gwen John's living in Paris, 
um, writers such as Nina Hamnett are saying, well, you know, if you go to Montmartre, it's all very aged can-can ladies and tourists. You shouldn't go there if you're an artist anymore. You need to go to Montparnasse. So Montparnasse is a place known at this time, 1904, as the artistic heartland of the city. It's home to studios, art schools, cafes, parks. It's near to the Bon Marche department store, to the Luxembourg Museum and gardens. And in these early years, Gwen John earned her living as a model, and here she is in a painting by her friend, Mary Constance Lloyd, painted the year after she moved to Paris in 1905. Lloyd, like her, had trained at the Slade. They became fast friends. They met, remained friends all through their lives, right up to Gwen John's death. Um, and Lloyd, interestingly, she's kind of disappeared from art history. But she made her name as a painter, an interior designer. She was a friend of the designer Eileen Gray. She was a friend of the Bloomsbury painter Duncan Grant. She showed regularly in the salons. So she was a kind of um, considerable figure in Paris. But also better known is the fact that from 1904, Gwen John posed for Auguste Rodin who became her lover for about a decade. And this is a Rodin drawing, two women embracing from 1908. It must have been quite a thing for a young woman in the, in the, at this time to go to the grand studio of the most celebrated sculptor in the world, perhaps even the most celebrated artist in the world and offer her services as a life model. His studio was always thronged with assistants, with other models. He kept a list of 99 models on his books that he could call on. He had two or three in the studio at any time waiting for his eye to light upon them. There would be patrons there, critics, all sorts of people, sitters visiting the studio. And Gwen John has the, the nerve to go along and offer her services as a life model. It's not exactly, I would say, the action of a recluse. The story of their relationship is well known, but equally what Gwen John might have taken from seeing Rodin at work at first hand for her own art is fascinating, I think. And in the exhibition, I've hung some of his drawings, including this one, which was lent by the Musée Rodin, alongside hers to explore the relationship, what she learned from watching him at work in his studio. Because Rodin's drawing had become increasingly important to him in the 1900s, he made thousands of drawings of the female nude at this time. And he exhibited them as works of art in their own right, not just as studies for sculptures. And when I say Gwen John learned from him, I think, I don't, she never emulated the way that he kind of emphasized an animal physicality in his drawings of women, the way he covered up their individual identities. You can't tell who these women are or the eroticism of his work, but she did watch and she did, I think, learn from his fluency and his risk-taking. This is her drawing of a young woman, and she's known Rodin for about two years by this stage. And this is in the collection at Yale. And again, we're very lucky they've lent it and it's come over to England uh, for the show. So he, Rodin would wash over a kind of rapidly sketched armature of lines with watercolor. And her drawings became ever more confident during these early years in Paris, much more fluid, much more spare. And this is a drawing of her friend, the Finnish artist, Hilde Flodin, who worked for Rodin as a practitioner and assistant in his studio. And I think the head is captured, so it's almost not there. It's so deftly captured. The grasp of form is so lightly drawn, but so complete. I think it's an astonishing piece of drawing and very different from the kind of work she was making in London. There were other Parisian artists too that Gwen John, if she didn't learn from them directly by seeing them at work, nevertheless connected to in the work she made in Paris. This drawing by Gwen John, again from the Yale collection, and again, we're very lucky that they've lent it to us. Um, this drawing is again, I think, of uh, Hilda Flodin, Gwen John's friend. And the close tones of this drawing the harmony between the body and the room, the casual arrangement of the model as if she's caught unaware in an intimate moment rather than overtly posing. This was really the starting point of my show at the, the exhibition at the moment. 
because this came to mind immediately. I saw this painting by Vuillard, which has uh, just been acquired by Pallant House. This is a model sitting in a chair combing her hair of around 1903. Now, during Gwen John's lifetime, not many critics, in fact, only one critic wrote about her as a recluse. Many others kind of connected her with artists that, that were around at her time during her lifetime. And they noticed the connection between her work and Edouard Vuillard's work. They spoke about her as equal to Vuillard, similar to him in her exquisite sensitivity to tone and in her fascination with the subject of women in rooms. And Gwen John knew of both Vuillard and Bonnard's work. I think that seeing Gwen John as part of this moment in Paris, in which the interior becomes very important to artists, means that it becomes much more than the idiosyncratic work of a strange woman shut away in her room. It becomes part of modern Paris. And this is her La Chambre sur la Cour, the room on the courtyard from 1907 to eight. Again, we're lucky that Yale has lent us this. Gwen John had painted interiors from her student days, as we saw in the group portrait I showed you earlier, but it was in Paris that this subject matter really preoccupied her and her new, her new home fed into the way she painted her interiors. This painting was made in her room at Rue Saint Placide, which is a wide street full of cafes and shops with the Bon Marché department store at one end. And this room is completely Parisian. She wrote to an old friend in England about it, telling him she was very proud of this new room because it had a hexagonal tiled floor, a lace curtain, and because of that, she was now a Parisian. Because of this room, she felt that she was a Parisian, and now she felt closer to the inhabitants of the French capital than to any English people. And when she sent this painting back to England in 1908, to show it, she sent it with its French title. The title La Chambre sur la Cour is her title. So she's sending this French work back to England, making it clear that she wants to identify herself in this way. And a critic seeing this work said, this and the portrait that she showed were among the greatest achievements in the whole exhibition. And this is in 1908. Again, not going unnoticed. So Gwen John's interiors are part of Paris, part of the wider idea of the room and the importance of the room in Paris. But I think Gwen John's have their own distinctive identity too. The rooms she painted are a woman's room, a new kind of independent space for women that united the domestic and workspace. She lived and painted all in the same room at this point. She couldn't afford more space, a separate studio at this stage of her career. Her rooms, I think, are an oasis of calm, of freedom, a kind of, a, there's a sense in them of that calm that allows contemplation and hours spent painting or working. This kind of space makes that possible. This second room was painted in her attic at the Rue Cherche Midi. And again, the room is clearly Parisian. The attic had become almost a cliche of Parisian artist life by this time. And there's the basket chair, which featured in many artist studios. It's light and portable. Attic's on the fifth floor of those Parisian houses. You can't carry this right to the top. There's no lips. So they become, they feature in a lot of artist paintings of their rooms. Again, we have the lace curtain at the window. Um, and interestingly, although the curtains are shut, there are signs of life outside the room that are included. There's the parasol for a sunny day. This is an age in which you, you carried a parasol to protect your complexion. There's the flowers from a street vendor or picked in the parks around Paris that Gwen John loved visiting. A few years after she painted this, in 1911, Gwen John moved from central Paris to the village of Meudon. And this is a view from the terrace of Meudon showing what a spectacular vista you have from this city. So again, it's often described as a reclusive thing that she's moving, but look at the view, I mean, it's astonishing. She could afford this because she had acquired in 1910, a very prestigious patron, John Quinn, who is an American lawyer and a collector of all the great names in modern art. And he comes across her work and he admires it so much that he starts to buy anything she cares to sell him. 
He says anything she wants to sell him, he will acquire. He also starts to pay her a regular stipend, almost a salary in return for her work. And that arrangement lasts from around 1910 till her death, till his death in 1924. So suddenly she has much greater financial freedom. She's free and she uses this to move to Meudon while keeping her room in Paris as a studio just for work. Meudon was by then, by the time Gwen John moves there, it was a noted beauty spot known for its spectacular views and known for its artistic associations. So impressionists, uh, including Bert Morisot and Alfred Sisley had painted it. And by Gwen John's time, Rodin had a villa and studios there too. It was close enough to the city to make traveling in and out easy. And even when war broke out in 1914, Gwen John continued to travel into Paris to paint. And she would also, interestingly, act as an unofficial interpreter at the Gare Montparnasse, helping the English soldiers that were arriving in the city and not understanding you know, how, to, how to navigate the city spaces. Despite the bombardment of the city during the First World War, the floods of soldiers and refugees from the front line, Gwen John refused again to return to England. She carried on traveling in central Paris from Meudon to paint in her studio. In her letters, she described the bombings, how she was unfazed by them, how she had to hide in the basement with the other inhabitants of her building, how she volunteered her services as translator for the English wounded. And her wartime interiors, and this is one of two paintings we've got in the show of, um, of this particular uh, interior with this still life arrangement. Um, her wartime interiors reflect wartime life. So in this painting, the comfort, the sunlit windows, the flowers of the earlier rooms, the earlier interiors is gone. The room is stripped of all decoration. There's nothing but the signs of culture left, pot of paintbrushes, on the mantelpiece at the top there, there, newspaper and a book. No flowers anymore, no sunshine. It was during or just towards the end of the war years that Gwen John began her best known and largest series of war works, a series of portraits of a girl in blue known collectively as the convalescent, a title she gave one of them. They might seem at first glance to have nothing to do with the time she lived in and where she lived. But in fact, they are deeply shaped by both. She titled this composition herself, Convalescent. So we can maybe understand it then as a painting about the regaining of strength after the war ended and a return to an ideal of art as an oasis of classical calm, peace, stillness and contemplation something that was so desired post-war, just after a war which had seen so much destruction and death. And Cezanne's influence is really obvious in this painting, I think. In the simplified composition with the woman in the blue dress, and this is Cezanne's, one of Cezanne's many paintings of his wife from around 1890. Being in Paris then was important to Gwen John in another way and that she was able to see paintings like this at first hand. Colour reproduction at this time was incredibly poor. You've got no real sense of how paintings looked in a book or a magazine. Colour reproduction was in its absolute influence, infancy and it was very garish and crude and you, you got no sense of a painted surface. In other words, Gwen John's paintings, paintings like The Convalescent, couldn't have developed as they did unless she was in Paris. Despite though her deep admiration of Cezanne and he was perhaps the artist that she admired more than any other, her estimation of her own work stood higher. She was always confident in the value of her own art. When she went to see a show of Cezanne's watercolors, she said, these are very good, but I prefer my own. <laughs> in 1919, the Parisian salons reopened after the war and Gwen John sent work in for the first time to the Salon d'Automne. From then on and for the next five years, she showed at various salons selling much of what she exhibited. A well-known Parisian dealer from a very smart right bank gallery told her she could name her price for one painting. And by the 1920s, her reputation in Paris was such that the American poet Jean Robert Foster, 
wrote to Quinn, John Quinn, Gwen John's patron, and said, everyone knows Gwen John's name and the salon will take anything she'll send them. Her paintings were successful, I think, because they gave something much needed to their viewers, beauty, stillness, contemplation. I mean, they're stunning paintings. For the same reason, her drawings of children were also much admired at this time and they sold. She made a whole series of these on holidays to Brittany in 1918 to 19. And I think they're remarkable. They're clear sighted always about the awkwardness of the body of the little figures. They've got a sense of wariness. There's nothing sweet or saccharine about them, but they're all the more moving because of that, I think. And of course, thinking about the post-war years, the immediate post-war years, you can imagine why images of children are incredibly popular because they, they make you think of new life, hope, fresh beginning, beginnings, everything the war had taken away. So when Guendron shows a series of 10 of these drawings in Paris after the war, they nearly all sell straight away. In 1926, Guendron crossed the channel back to London again, though she didn't go back herself. She had a solo exhibition at the New Chenille Galleries, which though it was her only exhibition during her lifetime that was a solo exhibition, this is a major achievement. It was far rarer in the 1920s for a woman artist to have an, a solo exhibition than for a male artist too. So it was a, a huge accolade to be given a solo show. In the catalogue forward for her exhibition, Gwen John quoted the French artist Maurice Denis, and this is one of his, um, drawings, woodcuts for The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis, which is published in Paris in 1903. And it shows uh, female figures on church kneelers praying in church. See the little hats and heads there and there's the priest at the front and there's the kneelers there. Yeah. Denis, Maurice Denis led the movement to bring the Catholic faith back into modern art. From the mid 1910s, this problem absolutely absorbed Gwen John's attention because she converted to Catholicism. In 1913, she was accepted into the Catholic church and she had a new ambition from this time to unite her religion and her art. In a private note, she told herself, I must be a saint in my work. Again, little sense of humility. She wanted to be amongst the holiest, never just a handmaiden. Making a modern Catholic art for Gwen John didn't mean going back to hackneyed images of piety, old fashioned academic techniques, but bringing new experimental forms to express your faith. And Gwen John developed this radiant painting of a long dead nun. She's a figure who lived in the 17th century who had founded a religious order. She developed this painting from a tiny printed prayer card, prayer card about this big, a black and white image. She didn't have this woman sitting in front of her. It's quite an astonishing feat. And she knew that this series of paintings of nuns was an absolute breakthrough in her work. The series changed her painting technique, which became more experimental. The perfect oil glazes of the earlier work, we saw the painting of Dorelia, for example, um, were gone. Now she developed what she called her dry painting technique. She mixed chalk into the ground to paint on the canvas and chalk into the paint, which would have made it incredibly textured and dry and difficult to paint with. Um, and, and as you move the brush loaded with such paint across that kind of porous canvas, it skips and leaves patches showing of the canvas underneath. So she's purposefully, I think, creating the kind of unfinished look which Cezanne had pioneered. People wrote about the mystique of the unfinished in Cezanne's work. Seeing a group of Gwen John's nuns together and at Palam we've hung them, we've painted a cloister on the wall and we've hung them in a row. So it's almost like they're looking out at you from a cloister. Seeing a group of them together, I think reveals the distinctiveness of what Gwen John gave to modernism in the religious, in the sense of religious art. She didn't paint female figures from Bible stories. There's no Martha's, Mary's, there's none of those figures, but she painted a powerful woman of the church who had started her own order of nuns. And when she painted a young woman in a nun's habit, she was fascinated by the contrast between the very stiff formal clothes and the figure who's kind of smiling complicitly back at the artist. It's almost as if she's 
she's fascinated by the contrast between this young fresh face with the smile and these very austere kind of uh, this very rigorous austere habit that she's wearing. Gwen John's interior painting continued in the 20s, but in a new way. The objects and the furniture increasingly were kind of paired back to create a, an arrangement of pure paint. There were nods to still life, to real life outside the artist's room still, as in the flowers and the parasol in um, a corner of the artist's room. In this painting, there's a bundle of bright feathers here which clearly aren't from the birds that lived in the forests around Meudon, might have been bought from the Bon Marché. And there's a Japanese doll in the center of the painting. I think this might even be a subtle reference to the work of her old teacher, Whistler, who had peopled his canvases with models in Japanese traditional dress. In Gwen John's hands, Whistler's women in their kimonos become a doll on a tabletop. There were new relationships too in Gwen John's later years. Here we have a very rare photo of Gwen John. There she is in her feathered hat. In the middle is the art dealer, uh, Henri Pierre Rocher, who was a very uh, well-connected and successful art dealer at this time. And then later, strangely, went on to write Jules et Jim, which became a Nouvelle Vague film, yes. And then here is the uh, American poet, Jean Robert Foster. And this is the three of them in Paris in the early 1920s. Gwen John became very close to Jean Robert Foster for a time. In fact, she seems to have been a little in love with her. Like John, Foster was a self-made woman. She'd started life working as a teacher, then moved to New York and became a fashion model, then became a journalist, then became a poet. Gwen John wrote to Foster, that her love for her was like a small bunch of green leaves with some small white flowers. Something very simple, yet beautiful. And this is a, a really stunning, I think, watercolor of, by Gwen John from Wales, which again is in the exhibition. Gwen John's work began to change even further. She increasingly liked to work on a small scale. Increasingly, she valued an idea of modesty and understatedness, not for her the kind of arrangements of bright exotic flowers painted by Gauguin, Monet and those kind of artists. She favoured wildflowers, grasses, what we might think of as weeds. And by 1928 she was able to buy her own place in Meudon for the first time, a little house on stilts in the middle of a garden. Her friendships with old friends in England continued and women who were living who'd moved like her from England to Paris but there, were also, uh, there was also another late romantic attachment on Gwen John's side, at least, with a woman who was a neighbor at Meudon. This is Vera Umansov, who was the Ukrainian born sister-in-law of the philosopher Jacques Maritain. And they lived in Meudon and they were close neighbors of Gwen John. And for a time in the twenties, Gwen John became passionately attached to Vera and she gave her a weekly gift of a drawing. Lucky Vera. <laughs> it was to Vera that Gwen John went when the priest told her that she shouldn't draw in church. She developed a new technique, making small scale experimental drawings during church services that she would then fill in with flat areas of gouache back in her studio. The priest noticed her doing this and told her that this was a sin. Church was only for praying. Gwen John went to Vera and asked Vera what Vera thought. And Vera told her with some irony, I think, well, if the priest says it, it must be true. Gwen John ignored the priest, I'm glad to say, and carried on drawing. Gwen John's work continued to evolve, even though she'd begun to fall physically ill in her late 50s, suffering increasingly long bouts of ill health. Landscape had begun to interest her for the first time, or rather the scenes around where she lived in Meudon. She didn't paint the stunning views from Meudon that I showed you in the photograph with the Eiffel Tower in the distance. Those kind of views had become a tourist cliche by this time. Instead, she paints this street leading to the terrace with small figures, really beautifully captured, I think, in just a few lines here. Figures wandering up and down the street. And she also began to paint the Meudon streets at night 
She had thought nothing of walking through France with Dorelia McNeil years before, sleeping outside when she needed to, and she carried on doing this throughout her life. She would go for walks around Meudon, and if she was too far away to get home at night, she thought nothing of staying out, just sleeping in her clothes. Quite astonishing when you think of the period and the kind of clothes that women wore in those days. Nothing that wicked away the sweat, no walking boots, nothing like that. Her interest in uh, working in close tones that she kept all her life uh, developed in a new way because she began to paint scenes after dark. And this is a night scene at Meudon. Again, perhaps she's thinking of Whistler, her early teacher and his nocturne, his famous night scenes. Even though she was increasingly ill, Gwen John's plans for painting never stopped. As late as 1936, three years before her death, when she was already ill, she was planning to travel to Paris to train with a Cubist painter, André Lote, because she believed that he could help her with some problems in painting that she hadn't worked out yet. I put this in purely because it's one of my favorite works in the whole show. It's from Southampton and it's a work from 1923 to four. And you can see there's a stack of canvas stretches there. So it's a sitter in Gwen John's studio. Gwen John was not remotely self-effacing about her work or her reputation. She knew her art would have value in the world. And she also believed that that was important. She told herself in a note, don't be afraid of falling into mediocrity, you would never. And she knew that hers was the kind of nature that relished a struggle. There must be fight, she wrote in a moment of self-awareness. I'll finish now with another of Gwen John's notes to herself, a quote from Oscar Wilde that she liked so much that she copied it out. It's from his novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray the story of an artist and the portrait he paints that takes on a life of its own. The artist in question is getting the heebie-jeebies about exhibiting. He can't bear the thought of showing his work to the critics and facing an onslaught from them. His friend tells him he must ignore it, all of that and he must exhibit. In fact, he should value, he should relish the chatter about his work, good and bad, because, and this is the quote that Gwen John copied out, there is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. Gwen John would, I hope, I know, have thoroughly enjoyed the fascination with her art and her story that carries on today. Thank you.